this Independence Day, let's celebrate our freedom in Christ. Through Him, we are free from the death and sin that bound us. He has paid the price and we are justified through His blood. We are risen with Him and have eternal life. He has given us His Spirit and we have the freedom to be in communion with Him. Let's never forget that the true gift of freedom we have been given in Christ. Happy Independence Day. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Let's stand to our feet. I want to wish you a very, very happy Independence Day weekend. And uh, as we just saw, we want to also, of course, always remember true freedom is in Christ. But we do want to stop for a moment and worship with gratitude. And let's show God gratitude for this great nation we do get to worship him freely in. And let's sing God Bless America this morning. Can we do that? God bless America. Land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America. Continue to worship this morning and let's sing gospel song. Yes, give God praise for having our freedoms here in America to come and worship Him. But now we got to take advantage of the opportunity and really worship Him. Amen. Put your hands together. Let's sing gospel song. I'll always sing this gospel song. No higher hope, no greater love. A king
sets us free. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we normally like to have you standing just in celebration of what we're about to see. But so everyone can see, in this room, we're going to ask you to be seated as we watch Believer's Baptism over here to the right. Good morning, Grace family. This is my friend Greta Coleman, and she's got something very special she'd like to share with you. My name's Greta Coleman, and Jesus is my Lord. In obedience with the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, Greta Coleman, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Give him praise, amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Hey, it's so good to know everybody's here this morning and to see you. Uh, we want, do want to make sure we always let you know that Pastor Bobby and Miss Cindy, they'll be at a kiosk here at my left at the end of the service. If you are a guest and you've never done so, but also if you're a member and have not yet met them, we ask that at the end of the service after we dismiss, you can come up here and you can meet them and they would love to meet you. And guests, we actually have a a gift that we give in your honor. So please be sure to come up and introduce yourselves and they would love to meet you. All right, let's continue to worship. Let's go and stand to our feet and let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue to sing his praises. You all sound great this morning. Let's keep, let's keep the praises going, all right? Lord Father, we do thank you for this great country. Lord God, that uh, we can walk in these doors and freely celebrate. And again, Lord, I mean... I always, Lord God, uh, look at myself before I say anything else. May I take the uh, ultimate, uh, Father, advantage of the freedoms that I have to worship you this morning. Lord Father, I pray that our hearts will be hearts of gratitude. Lord Father, even when things aren't going well, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You said you would never leave us, and you also said that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So, Lord, we stand on that. We know it's true. And, Lord God, we give you praise because you're good and your works are good. And now we're just going to sing that to you, Father. Help us to remember we are singing to God right now. We love you, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This song is literally Psalms, Psalm 92. Give thanks to the Lord for the works of his hands morning, night. Put our hands together and see how good you can sing this to the Lord. I give thanks to you, Lord, and sing praise to your name, almost Most High. I'll declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Oh, you, oh, Lord, that made me last. I will sing for
works. I'm going to ask Sandy to lead us on this one. The goodness of God. All my life, he's been so good. goodness is running after me, Lord. Every day I look back, Lord Father, the times, and I know, I know, I know anyone, Father, that 
has accepted Christ as Savior, they can look back and see how they were pursued by grace and goodness. And Lord Father, we would not be standing here today, regardless of the past, had it not been for your goodness and your mercy and sending your son. So Lord, I pray that as we sang, uh, with my life laid down, God, may we worship you, Father, by listening and applying your word. It's how you speak to us. It literally is the voice of God. And Lord, I pray that you will be with your servant, Pastor Bobby, as he delivers the message. And Lord, find that our, our hearts are good soil. In Jesus' name, amen. May be seated. Amen. Man, it's good to be home. It's great to be with you. Last week, we had an opportunity to do something we had never done. We were invited to a boat church. We preached and sang on a little island in the middle of Lake Harding, which borders Alabama and Georgia. So I had Bulldog fans on one side and a bunch of Alabama Roll Tide fans on the other side. And like I told my prayer partners today, I took many showers since then. So don't worry about it. I got all that rubbed off, okay? So uh, we had a great time. It was interesting and it was beautiful. We watched our children lead worship to have all four of your kids up there and you're back behind them and you have all these boats out on the water and, and uh, to see them leading worship was a huge joy. And then I gave them a message and, and they're amening. Uh, if they showed appreciation, they beat their boat horn. I thought that was pretty cool. So if you've got an air horn this morning, and you just want to chunk it a few times. If you like something, that'd be great. If I'm going too long and you're ready for me to stop, chunk it again, you know, whatever. Uh, wake up your neighbors. Things are going really well in the worship center. We are still a little ahead of schedule. Uh, we're still going to have some uh, donuts the next few weeks for you. In fact, we're going to change over in a few weeks to Beaver's Dojo. So if y'all like the dojo, they are on point. So we're going to have those for you. So if you've been eating three or four, you probably only eat one or two at a dojo, right? Because those are big. And that's a, a man's donut. So we are uh, grateful that you are continuing to come and support and pray for the work over there. It is looking great. Uh, continue just to uh, say, Lord, help us to get back in your house quickly. I love the three services. I don't mind it at all. I don't mind this space and the intimacy of it, but it is good to have that big room for growth and all of that. And so we're just excited about what God is doing on so many levels, not the least of which is, of course, the changed lives and the people that are coming to Jesus Christ. I also want to say Matt Harrison did a phenomenal job last week. If you heard him, I know you were blessed. If you didn't, go back and listen to the message. It was a really great word from the Word. He's a good expositor of Scripture, and he was dead on point with that Deuteronomy 6 text. We were blessed by listening to it, and um, so I hope that you'll do that. Also, he mentioned something to you about uh, Roe v. Wade and the overturning of that by our Supreme Court. I just want to say I don't believe that as a political issue. I believe that is a biblical issue, and I praise God that uh, it was overturned. So um, praise God for that. I also want to say this. As the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, now we have an opportunity, and the church has always done pretty good with foster care, adoption, crisis pregnancy. We can do even better, folks, at loving these young ladies and young couples well. When there's unplanned or unwanted pregnancy, we have to step up from womb to tomb. We've got to love life, and we've got to be a part of helping these couples, because those numbers are going to go up. Uh, talk to Pastor Kevin. Grace Goes got a great foster care ministry we're, we're doing. We're supporting multiple crisis pregnancy centers, but we're going to have to do better because those numbers are going to go up, folks, and we need to make sure we here in Tennessee are saying, you don't go to another state to try to take care of this. God will take care of you through his church. We will step up. We will be the people of God. So, but I thank the Lord for that. Man, I tell you what, I believe there was rejoicing in the halls of heaven for life. And so uh, we are in Genesis. We started in January, y'all, and we're going to finish chapter three today. Praise the Lord. We are making progress. Uh, I am going to finish this chapter. I'm telling you right now, we're going to read verse 15 together. I've been saying all along, if this is true, right? The series is called Genesis Fact or Fiction. If this is true, guys, this makes all the difference. If this is true, if it's not true, you can disregard it and live your life. But if Genesis is true, it makes all the difference in the world. And it makes all the difference in this life and the life to come. And so what we've got to do is you've got to make a choice. If this stuff is true, and here's the thing with chapter 3, it absolutely aligns with reality and shows us why things are the way they are today. And so it helps us to understand this is why the world looks the way it does. This is why life has been uh, uh, so underplayed and undercut and undervalued. This is why, because mankind is living under this curse 
of sin. But there is a solution. His name is Jesus Christ. And so what we find is that God has made the way. He shows us in this proto-evangelium, first gospel. That's what it means, proto-evangelium, first gospel. Y'all say it with me, okay? We're gonna put it on the screens, then we'll throw a bunch of blanks in. By now, surely you've got it memorized if you've been coming. We've been doing it for, what, two months. All right, let's say it. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the Lord cursing the devil cursing the serpent. We'll see it in the text today. You ready? Let's do it again. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Good. Now you've got it. So in the last mini series, when I was here a few weeks ago, the blame game, I said, when we sin, God comes to pursue us. But when we sin, we often try to hide from God and we often try to shift the blame. That guy over there, that girl over there. Today, we're gonna have this balance now called punishment and provision. And I want you to look at the screens on this because when we chose the graphic, we made them, yeah, don't look at me, put the, yeah. Punishment and provision is, do you see how those things are balanced? Because the Bible shows us balance. So if you're taking notes today, if you have grace notes, this is the way I wrote it. We're going to see the biblical balance between law and love, truth and grace. Now, I'm going to leave that up for a minute because we're living in a culture that says you can't have them simultaneously. And that is false. Today, you have to kind of throw out the truth. You kind of have to throw out the law in order to have love and grace. And that's not accurate at all. In fact, we live in a world now that's made truth so relativistic. You have your truth and I have my truth. But y'all know that ain't the way the world works. You think you've got $5,000 in your checking account. In reality, you got $5. You go and you take a deposit slip to the teller and say, I'd like to withdraw $5,000, please. And she says, you don't have $5,000, bub. You got $5. And you say, well, that's your truth. Man, they're going to throw you under the jail or the loony bin because that's not the way the world works. You can think all day long, red means slow down, but that's not what it means. In fact, we went through a light last night and I saw the camera flashy thing. Y'all better pray for us because I don't know if I got zapped or not. But here's the thing. You can argue with that stuff all you want, but when your picture's there with your hand on the steering wheel and your license plate, you're had, man. I, I, I think they were getting somebody else. I'm pretty sure of it. I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Here's the thing, though. You can argue all you want, but the reality is you can't just have your truth and my truth. That's not the way the real world works. The real world says there is truth. There is law, but there is also love and there is also grace. And so what I want us to see is this balance. You see, everything has changed for Adam and Eve when they disobey the Lord. Their rebellion has caused tremendous consequence. Listen to this commentator who said, they've lost their capacity to rightly enjoy God's good gifts. We see in the text that perfection is replaced with pain and a joyful marriage becomes an unequal partnership and happy cultivation becomes sweaty toil and a beautiful garden becomes a briar patch and once imperishable bodies begin to slowly decay and ultimately die and Adam and Eve will be removed from their garden home forever. Because everything that was good and good and good and ultimately very good is now turned on its head. And y'all know what's coming. You know what's coming. When we hit Genesis 4 and we begin to track through just in the first book of the Bible, we're going to find we're going to have find murder. We're going to see rape, we're going to have disease, we'll see drunkenness and ultimately we'll see death because the world we live in today is mixed up and messy because of original sin. Our first parents messed up, y'all, and we all mess up too, don't we? We're all in Adam and in Adam all die, but when we have a new daddy, when we're in Christ, all are made alive. So in that vein, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. I'm going to read Genesis 3, picking up 14 to the end. I wasn't sure if I could do it, but we did it in the first, so we can do it in the second. The Lord God said to the serpent, remember what's happened. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent. So in reverse order now, God starts with the serpent, and the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, 
more than every beast of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Now here's our verse. And I will put enmity, hostility. You will, there will be a barrier, a wall. You will be enemies between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And now God shifts. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now to Adam, he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field and the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, this is a play on his name in Hebrew, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That word in the Hebrew there just means life or living, okay? That, that Hebrew word. Also for Adam and his wife, this is so incredible right here. The Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. We'll unpack that. And then the Lord God said, behold... The man has become like one of us, Trinitarian language here, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. That tree, by the way, we see later in the scripture in Revelation and God brings it all together. We see that tree of life and glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your truth that has no mixture of error in it. You have spoken. Now give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to be open to truth, then hands and feet to live it out. Bless every person here, not only in this room, but out there watching, listening, tuned in, ready to see what you would say to us now. May it all be for your glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys. Would you be seated, please? And let me give you a couple of key truths here. Because of God's holiness, we're gonna start there with God's holiness. Because of God's holiness, he always punishes sin. God always punishes sin. Sin. Now, y'all just chew on that for a second, because I know we don't actually live that way. We think, well, I'm glad I got away with that one. No, this is the law of the Lord. This is the truth of God's word. The order of punishment given now is in exact reverse order. God came to Adam, who shifted blame to Eve, who attempted to shift blame to the serpent. So God will start with the serpent, then he'll come back to Eve, and then he'll come back to Adam, okay? So God condemned the serpent because the creature made itself available to the tempter. I, there's a lot about this I don't understand. I'll be honest with you. There's a lot about the rest of this chapter that I don't understand. The things I do understand are very clear. But what was this animal? Was this some form of, of I'm assuming a reptile since he uses that language of serpent. The Hebrew word is a little vague. But was it some sort of large lizard creature? Was it something up maybe in the tree? or I don't know. Was it a snake and, or did it become a snake? I, I can't answer that. What I can say is that whatever this animal was, more than likely a snake, a serpent, because of the, the language of you're cursed more than every beast and on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust. That would give us, and that's why you see Satan most often rendered from this text as a snake. The word is a little ambiguous, but it doesn't really matter, does it? What God is doing is cursing him. And I'm going to skip over verse 15 for a moment because it's one of the most significant verses in not just Genesis, but the Bible, but we're going to come back to it. But each one of these receives a specific punishment. So the serpent gets this punishment and then God really gives it to him in 15. But in verse 16, God then punishes the woman. Some have said the punishment doesn't align with the crime. It makes no sense. Why would God punish Eve in this way? Why would God punish Adam in this way? I actually think God's punishment perfectly matches with the crime. When you think about this pain in doing what God commanded, because God said be fruitful and multiply, so pain in childbirth, and then you've got tyranny and headship, and then you've got rebellion and submission. 
The judgment on woman now, ladies, hear this well. The judgment on woman is not childbirth itself. Childbirth is not a curse. Childbirth is a blessing. God commanded it. It is the first command in the Bible. The very first thing God tells human beings to do, populate this place. So when God says be fruitful and multiply, that's not the curse. It's always been God's plan to produce the next generation. But now there are going to be complexities and difficulties that accompany, including pain. The word pain is there. It's going to hurt. Now, I know we have modern medications and we have all of these other things, but somehow pre-fall, God was going to make this a smoother, easier, more peaceful process. It is not that way. I have watched my wife do it all natural four times over. It is not peaceful. I think I still bear some scars on my hands. Don't y'all feel sorry for me. I went through all of that. You know, I, I don't like it when you guys say we're pregnant. Cut that out. That creeps me out. Your wife is pregnant, bub. All right, your part was over and done long ago. So here's the thing. <laughs> Quit claiming you're pregnant. It's weird. That's leftist mess. So what does this mean? You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna be in pain. I know, I know, if you have an apple, there are pregnant dudes in your emojis now. <laughs> Lord, help us. So let me offer an explanation to the second half of this. The first half is easy. The second half of 16, though, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. What in the world does that mean? Well, think about it. Because of the type of sin and the curse, the man and woman now face struggles and contention in their relationship. They're going to be battling now. I think Dr. MacArthur actually said it best. He said, sin has turned the harmonious system of God-ordained roles into into distasteful struggles of self-will. If I were rewriting it, I would have probably put disgraceful struggles because most of us know if we're in marriage, it's not all coming up roses. It's not always easy all the time. There are some real challenges, some battles, and these lifelong companions, husbands and wives, are going to have to have the help of the Lord to make it, to get through it. It's going to be different. You see, God had said in Ephesians 5, 22 and following, this is my order. Man, Adam, you are to be the spiritual head of your home. You are to love and lead your wife. You are to sacrifice for her as Christ would do for the church. Ladies, you are to willingly, willfully submit to the servant leadership of your husband as unto the Lord, as an act of worship. That is to be a beautiful system. But here's the thing. Now, there's all of this tension and this conflict. You say, why did it happen that way? Well, think about it. Eve led her husband Eve, and he, like a little sheepdog, he, or like a sheep, not a sheepdog, they're cool. Like a sheep, he just followed her. He just followed her. He just did what she did. She took and ate. She gave to him with her. He ate also. So you see what God's doing. God said, Adam, you didn't understand from the first time. You were to be the leader. Now I'm going to make it that much more challenging. Now look, this continues to today. And I'll be honest with y'all, this kind of makes me ill because there are some, even Christian guys, Todd and I, we've, Dr. Harden and I have had this conversation. There are even some Christian marriage people that have this garbage teaching that's like married with children, Al Bundy style teaching. And they try to teach you like this. Now guys, we all know you're a bunch of morons. And we all know that your wives have really got it going on and they're really leading and we really know that they're in charge. So why don't you just get along and always say yes and never do this and just be the wimp, right? The whiner that you really are. And this is the culture. This is the way movies portray us guys. We're just these schlumps and all we can do is hold the remote and go football. I mean, that's all we're good for. But that is not what the Bible teaches, guys. The Bible says you are to lovingly lead. You are to be a servant leader in your home. You are to lovingly lead your wife. Will it always be easy? No. But when you're doing it God's way for God's glory and they know that your best interest is at the top of their list, your wives are going to willingly, willfully submit under your headship in the home. That's not the way the culture wants to teach it. That's not even the way some of these so-called Christian pop psychologists want to teach it. But it is God's way. That's what it should look like. And so Adam gives this, or God gives this curse to Eve. God gives this curse to Adam. What does he do with Adam? 17 and following. He says, look, you followed her. You heeded the voice of your wife. So now watch what's going to happen. That fruit that you took so easily. Oh, it's not going to come so easy anymore, bub. He says, look, cursed is the ground for your sake. What's interesting is the word ground is related to his name. Adam means dust or dirt. Adama 
Same word with an A-H on the end we would say in, in English. But Adama means ground. So what he's saying is your very name, your very being is cursed here. And the ground is now going to battle you. Are you saying there were no thorns and thistles and the ground wasn't battling Adam in the garden? Yes, that's what I'm saying. There was none of that. Adam was not weeding the garden before. He was working it. He didn't have to work against it. Now the world is fighting him. And so Adam will ultimately, dust, will return to the Adamah. That's what God said. God said, the Adama is going to fight back at you. It made me think of that Kansas song. Y'all know that Kansas song? Dust in the wind. Y'all never heard that? All we are is dust in the wind. Good. There are three other heathens in the room. So, <laughs> dust in the wind. This is what he said. All we are is dust in the wind. And to dust we shall return. That's actually what God says here. God says you are dust and to the ground, to the dust, you will return. And so it's very interesting. Look, Adam and Eve sinned by eating. Now they'll sweat and struggle in order to eat. Eve tried to manage her leader husband. Now she would be submissive and led by her husband, although she'll go kicking and screaming. The serpent tried to deceive and destroy the human race. Now he will ultimately be destroyed. Now remember, generically eating, let's just say, just eating food, that's not part of the curse. They were eating before the fall. It's in how they chose to do it. Uh, biblical headship and submission, that's not part of the curse. So you submitting to, that is not a curse issue. It's that they got it wrong they got it wrong, and so now in the fall, it's going to be with challenge and hardship and heartache. And so Adam was tilling the ground before. He did it with ease and pleasure. Now he's doing it with pain and perseverance, and he becomes mortal. Though he doesn't die immediately, his body immediately begins to change and decay. And do you know those early patriarchs and matriarchs lived so much longer than us? We'll talk about that when we get there. There's a reason they lived so much longer. There's a reason with sin and genetic mutation and how it changed. And people have always asked me, well, where did, you know, where did uh, uh, Cain and Abel, where did Abel get the, the wife and where did Seth get the wife? Well, listen, things were very, very different before sin continued to grow and evolve and mutate, not evolve in the Darwinian sense, but continue to grow into the human race and the animal kingdom and all of the world. See, now mankind experiences death as the normal way of ending life in this world. But such was not the case precurse. This judgment was delayed by God's mercy, but eventually death would impact all of the human race. That's why they didn't die immediately. God gave them time to restore relationship. But in the second Adam, in Jesus Christ, death holds no terror and no tyranny over any of us. But here's what we think we can do. We think we can dabble in sin and God will just look away. He's so busy. He's got so much going on. Surely he won't pay attention to me dabbling over here. It's like this guy, Gary Richmond. He was a former zookeeper. He had this to say. Raccoons go through a glandular state change at about 24 months. After that, they often attack their owners. Now, when I read that, I thought, wait a minute. How many people are owning raccoons? That was weird to me, right? But he said this. And I have, I have had a few times in the field against some raccoons, and I'm going to tell you, I don't want to mess with them. I go the other way, bub. So he said this, since a 30-pound raccoon can be equal to a 100-pound dog in a scrap, I felt compelled to mention this hormonal change that's coming to a pet raccoon owned by a young friend of mine named Julie. She listened politely as I explained the coming danger as the raccoon got older, and she, he said, I'll never forget her answer. This, her answer. This is what she said. It'll be different for me. Bandit wouldn't hurt me. He just wouldn't. Three months later, Julie underwent extensive plastic surgery for facial laceration sustained when her adult raccoon attacked her for no apparent reason. So, well, what does that have to do with anything? This. Sin often comes to us dressed in an adorable guise. We begin to play with it. And how easy it is to say, it will be different for me. I wrote it like this. Sin may look fuzzy, adorable, and even fun to play with, but it will always bite you in the end. You know, raccoons are cute. Raccoons are kind of fluffy and they have their little mask. But when my son, he he trapped a lot. When we first moved here, 
Bobby was, how old was Bobby when we moved? 12, right? 11, 12. It's the 11, 12 year old boy's dream to get a metal trap. The people that left our house, uh, that sold the house to us, had left one, and then I ha- happened to have a few other types of traps. He would, he would trap almost every day. He trapped many a raccoon, and I had to make him this big, long thing to let those raccoons out. We never killed anything. He just let them out and let them go. But until he finally, about a year ago, trapped a skunk, and I said, your trapping days are done, son. I won't even get into that story right now. I'm still a little mad about it. But anyway, the reality is you're always going to pay the price in the end. And you say, yeah, but I'm a Christian, Jesus will forgive me. Jesus has already forgiven me. I know I'm saved. I know there's nothing that'll separate me from God's love. Well, then, number one, you don't really understand God's love. You certainly don't understand God's holiness, and you're trampling all over God's grace. That's not the way Christians respond. Because of God's holiness, he always punishes sin. That's law and truth. Now, the second thing we got to see, this is beautiful. Because of God's love, he alone provides salvation. And his love and his holiness are not in conflict. God is perfect and holy, and holy other than us, but his holiness matches perfectly with his love. Those are some of his chief attributes. If you were to say to me, how would you boil God down to his chief attributes? I would probably say to you what theologians have said for thousands of years. Really, the chief attributes of God do seem to hinge around holiness and love. Now, there's all sorts of other words and terms and ideas around those things, but if you look at the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, you have a holy, perfect God. You have a loving, forgiving, gracious God, and they are not different gods. It is not the God of holiness and wrath in the Old Testament, the God of love and fluffy stuff in the New Testament. No, it is the God of holiness and love all over the Bible, which brings us to Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 3.15, we have this very strange language in this first messianic prophecy, this first gospel. The first thing that's strange is it says this. We know there's going to be hostility between good and evil. Always has been. But specifically now between Satan and those who come after him and Jesus and those who come after him. So Satan and his cohorts, fallen angels who we now call demons. Jesus and those who come after him who we call disciples, right? Right? So we have Satan and demons, Jesus and disciples, and there's going to be this war, the Bible says. And in the seed of woman, that's very odd. That's never used. It's seed of man. But no, not this time, because the Holy Spirit overcomes a woman, the Virgin Mary, and by that union, the God-man union, who formed, which formed Christ, as we know Jesus the Christ. Now, he has always been. The second person of the Trinity has always been co-eternal with God. But Jesus, the God-man, came to be through the virgin's womb about 2,000 years ago. And so in the incarnation, in that conception, God said there's going to be this grand battle. Satan, you're going to lose your head in the battle. Yes, you're going to inflict a wound into the seed of woman, but you're going to lose your head entirely. Now, I've I've written this down because I think it's important to understand. Eve and probably Adam almost certainly did not fully comprehend what the Lord was saying there in verse 15. Almost certainly they didn't completely understand all of that. But the serpent, because God's talking to the serpent, the serpent, Satan, that sly one, is not left in the dark. Satan is being cursed, and God says he will ultimately be crushed. That's what the Bible is teaching here. In this moment, Satan is not going to get away with tempting woman and man. And so that's how God is providing. God said, I'm going to make a way here to defeat the enemy. But look at verse 21, because this is also one of the most beautiful pictures of God's provision in all of the Bible. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, made tunics of skin and clothed them. What is that all about? Well, think about what they had done in verse 7. Y'all remember that, right? Verse 7, if you, if you have your Bible open or your phone, the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. What's the problem with a fig leaf once you pull it from the tree or the branch or the vine or whatever? It's going to wither away. You're going to be doing a lot of sewing, y'all. Those clothes aren't going to last. Those clothes are inadequate. Now, remember, the nakedness was not the problem. 
but it was their exposure. It was now the shame that they felt. And so what we actually have here is a sacrifice. Listen to the Believer's Study Bible. It's also called the Baptist Study Bible. Man's covering for his nakedness was inadequate. But God provided a more suitable and durable covering. Now, while the text does not specifically state that an animal sacrifice occurred, it is absolutely implied that God made tunics of skin. He did not kill Eve to cover Adam. He did not kill Adam to cover Eve. He took from what we might say was an innocent, uninvolved animal. And in taking the life of that animal, listen to me, substitutionary sacrifice, substitutionary atoning sacrifice. Think about it. You're just out there grazing. You're a sheep. You're a deer. You're doing, you're just doing your little sheep thing or your little deer thing. And bam, the hand of the Lord comes down over you and takes your life, takes your skin. You're like, what did I do? Right? Right? This is the biblical picture all the way through the Old Testament and into the New Testament. Genesis 3.21 reveals the very first sacrifice in the Bible. It is made by God to cover man's sin. Did you know that the bookends of sacrifice in the Bible are all by God? God makes the first sacrifice, and in the God-man Jesus Christ, he makes the last sacrifice once and for all. Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain for you and for me. And now now check this out. This is unbelievable. And I put symbolically. Now let me tell you why I put symbolically. I put that because, again, I don't want you to think the nakedness was the sin. That wasn't the sin. The sin was the disobedience. All of those things we talked about the last few months. And actually partaking of that fruit. God said don't and they did. But now they're ashamed. They want to hide themselves. Aren't you when you sin? I am too. Aren't you wanting to cover yourself, hide yourself? John 3 says that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So we want to cover our sin. That's why more bad things happen in places where people aren't paying attention. In the dark, in the night, in the corner. This is what man does. But here's the crazy thing. This is so cool, I think, when you think about it. In the Old Testament, there's this idea of covering, 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 covering. Covering sin, even on the mercy seat where the two cherubim with their wings cover it, you put the blood of the animal to cover the mercy seat. There's a picture there of Jesus lying in his tomb. But anyway, that's covering. And you bring your sacrifices. Every year at Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, the day of atonement, you bring your animals. But then you have to bring them more frequently. And you'll bring them over and over, and you have to do sacrificing. And the priests are actually sacrificing not just every year, not just every month, not just every week, every single day. The blood of bulls and goats and rams and lambs is flowing off the altar, covering sin, covering sin. Imagine you have a deep, gaping wound, and you wrap a towel around it, and it soaks through. So what do you do? You wrap another towel around it, and you wrap another towel around it, and you wrap another towel. Is that going to fix the problem? No, you're covering the problem. In the Old Testament, sin is covered. By the blood of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, sin is cleansed. Do you see the difference? He's not just covering it. He's not just band-aiding what you and I have done. He is cleansing it completely. Cathargizo, he's taking it away. And so in verse 21, we see the necessity of a sacrifice. We see the illustration of substitution in order to get those skins, to make those tunics, those coverings, those coats, if you will, for Adam and Eve. God made a way. You know, here's the deal. God's punishing them and simultaneously providing for them. I told you guys about you know, some of my shenanigans as a as middle school boy um, you know, and, and getting punished by my father. You're going to find this shocking, but actually as a child, I did sin one other time in addition to that whole smoking incident. I did sin one other time. And, and here's the thing about that. I was punished for that too, but my last name is still Lewis. I still had a place in the Father's house. I still had a place with my folks because we love our children and and we still provide for them. Even when they mess up. Even when they do things they ought not do. This is what God does for us. This is why I've called the message punishment and provision. The same God who judges, the same God who punishes is the same God who gives. He gives life. He gives second chances. And by the way, he's not just the God of the second chance, right church? What do I say? He's the God of another chance chance because you blew your second chance and I blew my second chance and God gave me a third and I blew that one too. And I don't know what number we're on, but it's real high and I don't have that many fingers and toes. And so he is the God of another 
chance. The same father who punishes still provides and promises an inheritance. You see, these last few verses can be very, very tricky and very confusing, but I'm going to take them very quickly. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Meaning this, man's eyes are now opened. Now, he's not like God in the sense of perfection. He's more like the patient instead of the physician, but he does know there's good and now there's evil in this world. And God says, I love them too much to allow them to live like this forever. There's this beautiful tree pictured in the garden. In addition to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Bible speaks of the tree of life. We also see about it in Revelation. If you want to learn more, go to Pastor Frank's class at some point. He'll get there in four or five years, I think. And so the tree of life is this beautiful symbolic tree where you eat of that fruit and you live forever. Here's the thing. I like to think about all of the imagery here in Genesis 3. The fruit of Eden's tree would ultimately bring a curse and death. The fruit of Eden's tree, whether it was an apple or a pear or whatever it was, would ultimately bring death. The fruit of Calvary's tree, the one hanging on that tree, when you eat of it, it brings eternal life. One brings eternal death, the other brings eternal life. Think about this imagery that God is doing here. He said, I love you too much to leave you in your sin, Adam, Eve, everybody that would come. So I'm going to have to kick you out of this place because I don't want you to eat and live forever in this damned state. And I don't mean that as a curse word. I mean that as a literal condition, a cursed, damned state. I love you too much to leave you here. So I'm going to put you away. And now there's a lot about this we don't understand. When God kicks them out of the garden and he puts these cherubim, these winged angelic creatures and this flaming sword, we see that language in other parts of the Old Testament. And we often see that as as they are protecting and they are covering, but we don't understand it because at some point God removes that entire place from the planet. And at some point in the new heavens and the new earth, God's bringing paradise back. There's this whole restoration going on in the end of the age. And I talked about that a little bit in my heaven series in Digging Deeper a couple of years ago. But the reality is that God is making it like it once was. But right now, God is separating us from that. And there's only one way to get back to paradise. What is it? It's not by working to cover your sin. You can't do that. Remember, your covering is inadequate. It is by taking the sacrifice that God has done for you. It is by looking to the Lamb of God who willingly laid down his life. The Lamb of God that did nothing wrong. The Lamb of God that was spotless. The Lamb of God that was tempted like we're tempted but never failed in sin. The Lamb of God who was and is God in flesh. His name is Jesus Christ. And when you trust him as your personal Lord and Savior, all of your sin, past, present, and future, is not covered. It is cleansed forever. And though your sin was as crimson. Now it is washed white as snow. God gives you an eternal do-over. God says, yes, I have to punish sin, but I did it in Christ. I will provide a heavenly home for you. Not only a place then and there, but eternal and abundant life here and now. You can start walking with God today. See, too much preaching is about what's coming. Just give me the keys to my mansion. I'll just take a cabin on the back side of the river of life. I'll just get, no, God didn't say he was giving you a cabin. You get keys to a mansion. But it's not just about what's coming then. It's about what God's given you right now. You have eternal life now if you know Jesus. You have the power to overcome sin and Satan now. And you say, but it doesn't feel like it. I don't care. <laughs> don't trust your feelings. Hello, Whitney Houston. Don't. Trust your feelings. Trust the word of the Lord. The Lord banished Adam and Eve. And he said, I love you too much to let you stay here. Because this place of pleasure and peace is now a place of pain and toil. And you know what? God loves you too much to leave you in your condition. Because of his holiness, he always punishes sin. But because of his love, he alone provides salvation I'll close with this. Pastor, professor, former seminary president Brian Chapel tells the story of something that actually happened in his hometown. He said two brothers were playing on the sandbanks by the river. One ran after another up a large mound of sand. 
Unfortunately, the mound of sand was not solid and their weight caused them to sink in quickly. When the boys did not return home for dinner, the family and neighbors organized a search. Finally, they found the younger brother unconscious with his head and shoulders sticking out above the sand. When they cleared the sand to his waist, he began to wake up. So the searchers asked, where's your older brother? And the child replied, I'm standing on his shoulders. You see, with the sacrifice of his own life, the older brother lifted the younger brother up to safety. And the tangible and sacrificial love of the older brother literally served as a foundation for the younger brother's life. Now, the Bible says that Christ is to us like an older brother. Listen, I'm going to summarize, I'm going to paraphrase and put together Hebrews 2, 10 to 17. Listen to this. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect or complete through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy, that's Jesus, and those who are made holy, that's Christians, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he may destroy him who holds the power of death. See, Jesus is destroying Satan. That Jesus might free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order to become a faithful and merciful high priest in service to God to make atonement for the people's sins. Do you see what God did in Christ? He became just like us. 100% man. Flesh and bone walking the dusty streets of what we now call the holy land. It was only made holy because the feet of Jesus touched it. And you see what God did there, which he said, you can't just keep covering your sin because animal blood can't ultimately take away human sin. And just like I did in Genesis, I made you an acceptable covering. Now, I'm gonna make you a total cleansing. And it's gonna come through the Lamb of God who, as John said, takes away the sin of the world. That is God giving us punishment and simultaneously provision. Would you stand as Jeff and Melissa come up? I want to ask you a question. I want you to look right here for just a second. Have you placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? See, the thing is, he is my Lord and my Savior, not because I deserve it or am good enough, but because he gave me this gift and I said, yes, I receive it. I didn't do anything for it. I just took it. I said, yes. You know, October the 7th, I didn't do anything special. I was alive before then. I was living nine months or so before then, but October 7th, I made an appearance in this world. I did nothing special, and yet every year, I seem to get some really beautiful tie or something fabulous tie, something just fabulous. Every year, October 7th. Are y'all writing that down? October 7th. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Kidding? Not kidding. Okay, so I didn't do anything, but that's the day that we celebrate. March the 30th. 1985, I didn't do anything. I certainly didn't deserve what God would do. But when I heard, and somehow it seemed for the first time, though I know it wasn't, that Jesus Christ died for my sin, that Jesus Christ was buried and raised by the power of God, that if I would reach out and trust Jesus Christ and simply receive what he had already done, I could be born again. I could have a new birthday And when I realized that March 30th, again, I didn't do a thing. I just said, yes, Lord. And from that day to this day, I have been born again, saved, not perfect, but perfectly forgiven. And you can be too. You can be too. It can be your day right here, July the 3rd. Man, that's an easy day to remember. July 3rd could be your birthday to be born again. So if you want to be born again, I want you to come.
Cindy and I will be over here in just a minute. Pastors and counselors will be ready, but you just may want to come and lay something before the Lord. You may want to come today and pray about something else. You may want to come and thank God for life and the victory we've seen in our land in these days for life. You may want to come and say, now God help us to be the church, to be better, to love these young ladies and young men and these families and these precious little ones. Help us to be stronger and better in that. You may want to come. You may want to lay anything else. I don't know what it is before the Lord. But I'll close with this verse. I love this verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Thank you so much for watching us today. God is doing absolutely amazing things in and through our Grace Baptist Church family. If you'd like to share anything the Lord is doing in your life, feel free to reach out to us through our website or our app. And if you're ever in the Knoxville area, come by and worship with us and our family of faith here at Grace Baptist Church.